So, uh, hi everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is uh, Adi, and I work here at PayPal as a data scientist. And my job is to develop machine learning algorithms for fraud detection. Now, PayPal is uh, known for being uh, safe and secure. Uh, however, maintaining this reputation requires hard work behind the scenes of developing fraud detection algorithms. So think about our problem as we have a transaction, a payment, and we want to detect if it is fraud or not. Now, as our algorithms perform better and better in production, we understand that we want more. The final model score is not enough for us, and we want to understand the story behind the model decision. So think about this example, an inconclusive score, the model predicts 50% chance for this transaction to be fraud. Okay, why? We want to understand, is it fraud or not? We, we, we don't really know what to do with 50% chance. So for example, if we could break this model score into how much every feature contributes to the decision, we can get more insights. So for example, here, maybe um, there is inconsistency with past activity. Maybe the user connects in a different time of day than she usually shops at. So this can increase the fraud chance. And uh, however, she does use her own credit card and she sent the product to her house. So that decreases the fraud chances and we reach the 0.5 decision. When having all of this in our mind, we can get more um, uh, interesting uh, insights about this transaction. Maybe this is a traveling customer, therefore the inconsistency, but it's the same person. So this type of explanation is part of the large field of explainable AI. Um, this is a huge buzzword coming up and it's uh, the next big thing, I think, in machine learning. And I am personally very excited about that. And um, to explain our models uh, can, help, uh, can help us a lot to get more data insights, to uh, debug our models, understand when they are uh, wrong, why, and maybe improve our own modeling process. Because if we train a model and we just check on the test set and that's it, we don't know what is really going on there. So, OK, we are good engineers. But if we understand um, what our models do, and then we can change them according to our gap analysis, we can get much better models in a less, maybe less time. And this specific type of explanation that I showed you here, breaking the model score into uh, feature attributions, this is called local additive feature importance. And it can be calculated using SHAP, SHAP uh, goal of this talk. Okay, so SHAP stands for Shapley Additive Explanations, and it is a method for local feature importance. Local because we explain a specific instance at a time. Now the input for SHAP is a trained model, F, and a specific instance, X. The output of SHAP is an explanation. For every feature, we get the contribution of this feature to the model score, F of X. Now, this is local, we said, we explain a specific instance at a time, and it is also additive because the sum of all contributions is exactly f of x. So our goal in this talk is to understand how SHAP uh, does this, what is the exciting theory behind uh, SHAP, and also how can we leverage SHAP to get insights about our models. SHAP theory is exciting. <laughs> it is based on Shapley values from game theory. They were defined in the 50s by Lloyd Shapley. He was an economist and mathematician, and he also won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2012. So think about a game. This is a cooperative game played by a few players together, and then by the end of the game, they reach specific amount of money. The question is, how do we divide the money between these players in a fair way, assuming each player contributed differently to the game? 
So what is a fair way? Shapley first defined fairness properties. He defined that um, a fair way, it means an additive way. It means that the sum of the money the all players get together should be the game result. And consistency, that if one player contributes more to the game, she cannot get less money. The most exciting thing in SHAP, I think, is the thing that Shapley values were proved to be the only unique solution for distributing this money, um, keeping the fairness properties, of course. Um, we can distribute the money however we want, but if we want to keep the fairness properties, it must be Shapley values. What are Shapley values? Now we go into the details. Shapley values for player I, Shapley value, is the amount of money that this player would get. How do we calculate this amount? We count the marginal contribution of this player. It means running the game with and without this player, but for every possible subset of players. Again, F is the game. M is the set of all players. S is a specific subset, and we run over all possible subsets. And I is our player that we want to decide how many should she get. So we take a specific subset of players. Now we uh, calculate the game result for this subset with and without our player I. And then we do this averaging over all subsets of players. And this is Shapley values, an average. OK. Now we're going to take this to the machine learning settings. And OK, like before. I want to highlight, this is the only solution for being a fair distribution of money. This was proved theoretically. Now we take it to the machine learning uh, settings, and this is, the, I think, the exciting thing that um, uh, Scott Landberg and Sue In Lee from the University of Washington published in 2017. They published their first chart paper. And they said, we are going to adapt Chapley values into the machine learning settings. Now, F is a model. M is the set of all features. S is a subset of features. I is a specific feature. And we want to, uh, to explain how do we give this feature its importance, its contribution, not to the game, to the model result. OK. X should be the specific instance that we explain. As I said, SHAP is a local method. We explain a specific input instance at a time. So we are now explaining how much feature I contributed to f of x. So how? We get, we take, uh, we count over all possible, all possible subsets of features, and we calculate the model result on the subset with and without feature i, we this um, okay. <laughs> we we take the difference between those two results with and without feature i, and then we get uh, a specific uh, marginal contribution. We average it over all possible subsets of features, and this is the sharp value for player i uh, for feature i. Sorry. Now, by following the definitions of Shapley values, and this is what Sharp authors proved. We are following the definitions of Shapley values, and therefore, we are the only unique solution um, to distribute the contributions of the features by uh, and keeping the fairness uh, properties. So this is the only possible solution to keep our additivity and consistency um, of the feature attributions method. OK, that sounds perfect. <laughs> perfect. We have a very good. Um, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, is it the same model for all n features and n minus one features, or do we need to reiterate the model? This is a perfect question. Okay, I'm just talking about it. Okay, so we have two questions, two main, main, very big challenges here. First, I told you we should count for every possible subset of features. Now, every possible subset is an exponential time. And this is a problem, right? It's not practical if we have a large number of features of our model. The second problem is, I told you, and this is exactly what you asked, you should run a model with missing features. I didn't say you put null. I said missing features, no features. How do you run a model with part of the input is missing? This is a big problem. 
And therefore, we need the SHAP algorithms to solve it. And I'll, this is what I'm going to explain. How do they solve, in different options, these two problems? For you to have just an intuition, what is the most naive way you could calculate CHAP values? OK, just train a different model for every subset of features. Now, if you train a different model, you can run it with the features you trained, and that's it. It's an exponential, of course, and you have to train. It's not practical, but this is very naive, and just for intuition. Now, actually, this doesn't solve our problem because I want to explain my model in production. If I retrain a different model for every set of features, this is not explaining my model. This is explaining some feature of the data, some characteristic of the data. And now, this is specific, a very interesting thing. And if you want to read more about it and you want, you should go to Eden. <laughs> say hi. Eden's post. I give here um, uh, the link. And this is exactly the subtle issue he explains. OK. So let's focus. We want to calculate additive, um, uh, locally accurate uh, additive feature attributions. We want to keep the fairness properties. We want to calculate the sharp values. But we have challenges, so how do we solve them? So to our best of luck, this is exactly what SHAP package in Python does. They just implemented a few algorithms. Actually, they implemented a lot of algorithms. I will explain a few of them to solve these challenges. So you can pip install SHAP. It has a very user-friendly API. Actually, as you see in this piece of code, you don't really have to understand anything about what is going on behind the scene to apply SHAP. You just do SHAP dot something, SHAP, SHAP values, blah, 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 you have the SHAP values. What I'm going to explain is what is going on behind the scenes, which algorithm you want to choose, what do you have to supply as an input, and a uh, more interesting thing than just apply it. So the first algorithm I'm going to uh, describe is the kernel explainer. SHAP kernel explainer is an algorithm which is model agnostic. You can apply it to every function. It assumes nothing about the model. However, it calculates only approximation of the SHAP values, not exact values. Why? Because instead of going over all subsets of features, it just samples some of them. So it's an approximation. And you decide how much subset you want, it increases your runtime accordingly. How do they deal with the missing feature problem? This is more interesting, in my opinion. They just say, OK, we cannot just uh, reduce features from our model. So let's just replace their values with, with something that you, as the user, tell us, which is a background. You, as the user, should decide what is your background data set. And this is an interesting question I'm going to, de to describe here. And you supply it as an input to the SHAP uh, method. And it just replaces values, take the missing features that you have by the SHAP uh, equation, it replaces them with features from your uh, background data set, with values from your background data set. OK, so what background data sets people use? Ma? OK, yeah, I just um, I have it here. So um, <laughs> thank you. So the, um, for example, people use their whole training set. Now, if I replace the values for everything I have in my training set, you understand that it increases runtime also. So maybe, just a second, you, maybe you want to do just a k-means approximation of your data set or something like this. People use the median of the data set if they understand that this is a back, good background. Or, for example, for images, you might choose an all black image or something like this. But you should decide what is your background. And if you don't decide, you just run it with something and you hope it's going to be fine. <laughs> now, uh, the thing I wanted to highlight here about the background is that there is a story. I cannot give you uh, specific uh, instructions. This is the background you should use as more um, things in explainable AI. This is an open question. Nobody really has a real answer to how, which background should you use, but I have a story. This story is a real story. It's taken from a GitHub issue. Actually, if you're interested in sharp values, go to the GitHub issues and start reading them. People ask Landberg a lot of questions and he answers. Very nice and interesting and well answers. And uh, it's a very um, good resource. 
So this specific issue, after I incorporated it in my presentation, I understood that this, the person that um, asked this question is Liat. And she's a researcher, a PhD student in Ben Gurion, doing a research about explainability. And um, she couldn't come here, but uh, yeah, this is her question about the background data set. So what is the question? She said, I have a sparse data set. For example, I have measurements of uh, body parts. I have measurements from the lung and from the head. So this is a very sparse data set. And for example, I have a feature indicating if this measurement is coming from the lung or not. Now I want to explain an instance, a specific instance from the lung. Which background should I use? So if you choose only lung background, you are safe um, in terms of the distribution. You are not going out of the distribution because this is a lung distribution. This is actually not true because in the lung you, you also can have some circumstances and some uh, requirements about the distributions, but let's say it's simplified. Okay. So, however, you want to replace the is lung feature with something and you are not going to replace it with anything other than one because this is what you have in your background. So how would you understand the impact of the is lung feature if you cannot replace it with anything else. However, if you choose the old data set as a background, then um, you are safe in terms of you are going to replace the is lung feature with zero, but um, you might go out of your distribution very, very fast, and I'm not going to talk about it. This is a very big issue, and I'm, I don't have a solution. Okay, so this is about background data sets. Now, another very interesting thing about um, sharp kernel exp Okay, yeah. Can you please explain the purpose of the background data set? So, in short words, the, uh, the question was, can I explain the purpose of the background data set? So, the purpose of the background data set is to provide you values to replace missing input. In the SHAP uh, formula, you have to run your model with some input missing. You have to sample subsets of features and when you have a subset, it means that part of the features are, are missing now from your model. And you, how do you run a model with missing input? You have to, see, to put something because the model should need something to run with. So the, the, option for, the option here that the SHAP elders found is, OK, we just replace it with background. And this will mimic missing features. I didn't say that it's the best way, but this is their way. So. Um, Another very interesting thing about kernel explainer is the connection with lime. Lime is another feature, local feature attributions method. And actually, um, it was uh, published a few years, a year before SHAP. What lime does is to train a linear model that <laughs> approximates our model, but in a very specific point in the local area of our point that we want to explain, right? This is a local method. So they train a linear model to approximate their big model just in a specific area of the, of the, of the distribution. Now, what is this area? What does it mean local? So they have a kernel function to describe locality. But this kernel function is not provided to you. You should use whatever you want. This is an, a hyperparameter. Now, Sharp authors pr uh, proved that if you run line with their specific kernel, you are actually calculating Sharp values. So this is the connection between them, and this is a very um, interesting result because then they can use the line implementation of running linear regression um, on the area around your mod around your instance, and you uh, with the locality of their kernel, and then you get Sharp values. Okay. Another very interesting algorithm is the tree explainer. Now you can apply it to only tree-based models, but it calculates exact Sharp values in polynomial time. And this is a very, very interesting result. How do they do it intuitively? How do you run a tree with missing input? So you traverse the tree, run, right? You traverse the tree to run the model. Now you encounter a specific uh, split and your input is missing, so you don't know where, where you do need to go. So you just go both ways and recursively sum up the results, average the results, and this is intuitively their algorithm to mimic missing features in a tree. And they keep track of the tree traversals to avoid repetitions, and therefore they manage to calculate all subsets, but in polynomial time, because they remember things in the middle. 
Okay, so this is a very elegant solution, and if your model is tree, um, it could be random forest, it could be uh, gradient boosting, it could be active boost, many, many things are supported. You should first try this one because it, you should supply no background and it runs the exact chap values uh, in a, a polynomial time. So for trees, this is better. For deep learning models, for neural networks, they also provide a different algorithm. And this is really out of the, of the scope of this talk because it's a very complicated to describe. I would just say the very basic intuition. They use a connection with another algorithm, which is called deep lift. They calculate sharp values for small parts of the network. For example, just for the linear part, just for a non-linear function with one input, they calculate analytically very many, many sharp values in the network. And then the deep lift is being used to backpropagate all of this knowledge, all of these sharp values locally to get um, sharp values for your in input. So this is not a good explanation how it works, but this is just an intuition, and you are encouraged to read the papers. Okay, so many questions, yeah. The question was if the results of sharp values of deep explainer is an approximation. Yes, it is an approximation. Why? Because you should read like the paper, okay. And, and you also should provide some background data set, but for different reason, and we can discuss later. Okay, so if you lost me, so now you should wake up. This is my take home story about the SHAP method, about the SHAP algorithms. And then I'm going to move to the practical part. So we need local, well, we want, but actually we need local additive feature attributions. Many methods try to solve it. I mentioned Lime, I mentioned DeepLift. There are much more. However, only a unique solution can satisfy additivity and consistency, and this is the Shapley values. Calculating exact Shapley values is hard. Shap provides approximation for all models, all possible models, um, in a, an approximation with the kernel explainer. And considering tree-based algorithms, you can calculate exact chap values um, in polynomial time, do it. And for neural networks, you can use the deep explainer, which uses some connection with the deep lift algorithm. Okay, perfect, right? <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, <laughs> now if you are going to use chap values, um, you should just know that if you have a lot of, or some, a correlated feature in your data set, you can get unexpected results. I will give just one short intuition uh, because we don't have a lot of time. But for example, if your model has two identical features, I just replaced the name, but it's two identical features trained on the label. Now, if my model uses just one of them, so SHAP would attribute all the value to the first, uh, first uh, feature, x1, and x2 would get zero sharp values. However, if the model uses both, sometimes x1, sometimes x2, and you cannot control, you can try, but not every time you can control which correlated feature your model uses, so then you might get your sharp value split into two, and if you have not two correlated features, maybe you have 10 because you have I don't know, thousands of features for your um, model, then your sharp values might be split into very, very, very small amounts. And then you're gonna think that this feature is not important because it has a low sharp value and it's not true. So because sharp is additive, you can sum up things together and it's, it's fine, you can do it. Um, so maybe this is a solution, but you should think about it. Perfect, okay. This is the practical part. Um, what do we do after we calculate chap values? So now I will mention one thing. This is also an open question. I didn't see many people talking about what do they do with chap values. Maybe they calculate them and just show them to their customers. Maybe they change them a little bit to be more expected and then they show them to the customers. But I didn't hear many people, and I, I'm looking for it, so if you have a story, let me know afterwards. I want to hear people really using SHA values for doing something. Um, so 
One thing you can do with sharp values is one thing, one basic thing is to um, just investi investigate one specific prediction, as we talked about now. One more interesting thing you can do is to aggregate a lot of sharp values for many instances and see some global view of your model. And this is an example I'm going to show. There are many more things you can do. You should go into their GitHub repo, see the examples, see the notebooks. They have also an archive paper explaining a lot of aggregations. I'm not going to explain all of them. I will dive uh, deeper into the uh, central aggregated explanation one. So, yeah, sorry. But when you see it in an instance level, you get some kind of uh, insight. But once you get on the higher level, you get another insight. It's not correlated between the, it can each other. So you can get, a, a, let's say, a precise uh, decision what is going to happen in production about your model, what is affecting your results. Because if you see it in a macro level, you have some idea. But if you see it in a low level... You, you just mentioned that there is a difference between looking at the local or the global view. They are not the same, they are not providing the same insights. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So what, what is the usage of, of in this case? Of local or global? Okay, local I can talk to you later, but I think it's a much more trivial, the usage of local, you have a problem, your model predicted this is a fraud, but it is not, it's like the PayPal CEO, and uh, you blocked him, and then, uh, okay, you get like some escalation, what, what did your model do? So you want to investigate. But uh, the global, I will showcase one thing here, but there are much more cases. If you want, just Google it and, and see many people try to explain. Uh, what they do with global um, uh, views. And I can also say, before joining PayPal, I was in, uh, I did my master's in uh, Iran Segal's lab and uh, about um, personalized nutrition and personalized uh, uh, medicine and Haggai, um, <laughs> they use a lot sharp values in the global view to investigate some uh, really um, medical features. So um, you can take a look as well of their papers. And okay, so you see this view, and if you are using sharp values or someone in your office uses sharp values, you're gonna see it because it's very easy to implement. You just do sharp values dot uh, summary plot and you get it, it's very easy. Now, what is this plot and what do we see here? Um, so let's um, break this plot into details and understand what do we see here. So look at the left side of the screen you see the whole plot. Every row is a different feature. I said I'm aggregating sharp values for many instances and also for many features. What is the color? The color is the actual feature value. For example, maybe the first feature is age, and so um, red values are older people and uh, blue values are younger people. What is the x-axis? The x-axis is the sharp value. Now you can see it in the um, zoom in. The sharp value can be zero. It means it didn't actually impact the model result for this instance, but it can be high positive value. It means it pushed the model, uh, the model output uh, up and it could be minus uh, neg uh, large negative value and it pushed the model output down. So you can see a lot of things here. For example, if you take the uh, um, right blue dot, you see that it has low value, like a young person, but high sharp value, so it increased the uh, prediction. However, you look to the left, <laughs> you look to the left and you see a red dot, this is an old person with negative sharp value, it decreased the model score. You look in the middle, you see many values and you see the, the thick bars, it's just a distribution, it's a jitter of the dots, many, many dots, every dot is an instance, and uh, you see many features that didn't actually impact the model. Many, many instances, for them, the age feature didn't really impact the model. So again, if you take a look on the global view, you can see something, you can see some pattern in your model, and uh, I will show you a specific example how we use this here. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so this is an aggregate for a single feature? Every row is a single feature. This is an aggregate for 20 features. 
ordered, actually ordered by their mean absolute sharp values. So the, we take the absolute because it could be negative and positive. So the absolute here in, in, um, represent the importance and we can sort the values by their mean, uh, mean absolute sharp values and then you see the most important, tw the 20 most important features, for example. Um, most important is debatable actually. <laughs> what, what does it mean most important? But with higher, uh, sh uh, higher mean sharp value impact. Okay. So what is our specific fraud case? So Aviv is here. She worked on it. Um, this is a specific model. We trained to predict fraud, of course, and we used only a specific type of features, features of consistency. You can imagine that consistency is important. If the person is more consistent, it, uh, high, it is an high, a higher chance for it to be the uh, account holder. And if it's inconsistent, maybe this is a fraudster. So what consistency features do we have? For example, time consistency, product consistency, and many consistency features. And we train the GBT, gradient boosting tree, to predict if this is fraud or not. Uh, very trivial uh, supervised uh, scenario. Now, we applied sharp values on the results of this um, algorithm for on the test set, for example. And we got this plot. Now, what do we use this plot for? to gain trust in our model. We want to see that um, our model uses features in the way that we, as we have the domain knowledge, think it should do. Not all the time you have domain knowledge, not all the time you know what the model should do, but sometimes you know and you want to check that this is what your model does, in addition to test your accuracy and everything. So what our model does, um, our model take the blue dot to the right, it means that people that are inconsistent with their past are more prone to be fraudsters. And this is reasonable. You see that the red dots are going mostly to the left. It means that inconsistencies in the account are more reasonable. Uh, consistencies uh, in uh, something very consistent in the account is more probable to be the account holder and the fraud chances are lower. So this is a very global view. I didn't say it is correct for every single prediction. I didn't say that this is the way every feature should look like, but this is a global view and it can help us get trust in our model. And just for a small um, uh, anecdote, so if you run this with random data, you don't see this pattern. And this is also a way to debug whatever you want. And if you see the random data, you see much more dotted pattern that it's not just all the blues go here and all the reds go there. It's much more um, mess, messy and, uh, and, and you should maybe investigate your model. Maybe you chose the wrong version. Maybe this is not your data set. I don't know, but this is a very, very easy way to implement. Uh, uh, something that gave you a very nice global view of your model. Okay, that's it. Um, our motivation was to look inside the black box. Sharp is a very nice way to do it. Um, it is theory based. We can trust it. We can know what it does. It's not just a heuristic. And it has a very practical implementation, so it's very easy to use. It has a lot of applications. You can investigate local model scores. You can see some global view, but there are much more. If you take a look at recent conferences, you're going to see a lot of people trying and starting using sharp values in more advanced ways. For example, to find shifts in your data set, to find um, a um, there is one paper discussing who is uh, more responsible to the score, the model or the data. There are much more uh, implications that are starting to pop to show up. And therefore, I think this is, uh, increases the, um, the importance of understanding what are sharp values because there are some kind of basis. They have, they have a lot, a lot of citations to their paper. Many people starting to use it. And if you don't understand this, it will be harder to understand all the applications on top of it. Um, so that's it.
Um, I should say that personally, machine learning explainability is a very interesting topic for me and I really um, do it now. These days we are working on a project on how do we use tools like SHAP and more to explain models, um, but in an actionable, in an actionable uh, uh, manner. For example, I don't want just to see the values, I want to do something, I want to help my customers understand the predictions, use them better, something like this. And um, if you are working on explainability or you doing some research about it, please send me a message. I really want to connect. We are started connecting people from this field and um, I don't know, creating a sub community or something like this. <laughs> and so um, I would be happy to take questions. The question is if we use it for multi-class problem. So, I think yes, why not? You want to explain the prediction, and so you mean multi-class whenever you predict a few possible outputs? I didn't do it, but I, everybody has, someone has an answer? Uh, it works. Yeah. It works? We work. Okay, uh, so yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, did okay. Okay, so the question is, there is a lot of criticism about using external method to explain models. Actually, this is called post hoc explanations. You train a model and then you try to explain predictions. And um, there is a criticism about uh, a lot of explanation thing. This is an ongoing research. Uh, there is no like the way to explain things. Um, my view is that you should first define what do you want as an explanation, like what is your audience? What do you try to explain? There are many different solutions. One solution can be to train a more transparent model. There are models like this, EBM of Microsoft, if you uh, heard about it, but um, the problem of these models, for example, in PayPal, I won't change all PayPal's production models now, right? I have already very good models. Explanation is like the next level, but first level is to prevent fraud. So. This is where the postdoc explanations are really, really useful. Yes. Just to uh, make sure I understood, in the, the last couple of slides, you showed an example where the model, uh, where you measured the sensitivity of the model, not just to the existence of the feature, but whether it's present or not, but to the actual value. I mean, how sensitive it is to a certain age range. So, how does that, how does that implement it actually? You only make it the, the feature disappear if it's... Uh... Okay, what, what I show here is the actual sharp values after I cut every dot in this plot is the final sharp value after you did all of these uh, sub sample subsets and missing features and that. That's the final sharp value. It's the average of the marginal contribution of this feature for this instance. So you calculate it using the sharp algorithms I showed in this lecture. This is actually the sharp values, you get the final result of applying sharp. We can discuss later. I will ask you later. Okay. Yes. What do you fit for? Okay. You ask what do what am I looking for when I'm looking at this yeah. specific plot? So this is a good question. There is no one answer. Specifically in this model, we try to make sure that the model is using the feature in the way we think it should. It should use the consistency in one direction. Inconsistent, fraud. Not con uh, consistent, not fraud. And if it doesn't do it, it's suspicious. Something is weird, maybe it's some uh, overfitting or something like this. But for different type of uh, uh, use cases, you might be looking for something else. Here we just looked at the pattern. Okay, so um, I'll be happy to take questions later. Uh, thank you very much for listening.